and welcome one and all to Frivolous Gravitas episode 30. Today we are a um uh, <laughs> we're approached with our esteemed guest Justin Hanischuk who you may remember from an episode I have yet to edit and post and our average everyday run of the mill Joe Jordan Roy. Just kidding, he's very special. Yeah, I'm not mass produced at all. <laughs> My wife would uh have a aneurysm if that were true <laughs> to know there'd be more than one <laughs> that would be terrible for the whole world actually <laughs> and wonderful at the same time but to get us started though uh just to keep everybody in the know our listeners should be aware that we are discussing the subject of faith and spirituality in modern contemporary sense with respect and relationship to our perception of spirituality in past tenses so I think what we'd like to talk about today with Justin is some ideas, um, just an exploration of thought on some ideas of how um, modern culture has changed over time and the emphasis and uh, influence that spirituality in the broader public at large has in effects in other social contexts or political contexts or population demographics, etc., so the ways that our lives are affected and changed by the biases and preconceived notions that we hold dear as core values, and also our emphasis and stringency in how we practice those faiths. So strictly speaking, faith in a spirituality sense, but not in any particular denomination, I think is where we're going to head and how it leads towards ideas of morality, uh, culture, and um, rules of law, and yada yada. So the yada yada will start post haste with Justin giving us some insights into the ideas that we'd like to cover today. Well, <clears throat> I was uh, making some notes yesterday. Um, I would want to start with a talking point uh, that we, we kind of touched on before we started is um, the fact that uh, people have lost their faith in a whatever it may be, whatever religion or denomination you are in a higher something other than yourself. And I think people have completely flipped that upside down into the point because of online, because of the internet, because of smartphones, that people have become really like, I don't know, the other, another way to put it, but their own emperors essentially, like they put the most important. Um, uh, energy and everything into themselves and they don't put it towards something like a faith if that makes any sense so sort of like prioritizing ideas or no it, everything i mean like it, it, the the self-worth and and everything and your uh you know your idea of who you are is uh in in society how you fit in everything like that is this, this... Uh, it just has completely shifted from um, you know, like no one goes to church anymore. Uh, no one even mentions um, any ideas of, uh, you know, those those lessons and teachings, like especially with morality and stuff like that. And everyone's just kind of completely <clears throat> devolted into these selfish assholes, I feel like, especially well, if you go online for like 20 minutes. One of the things that I find, and I'm, I, I kind of, I see this a lot too, is that, um, you get there's like kind of two forces going there's a move against individuality individualism yes. especially with um certain uh post structuralist um theories so i guess you could call a lot of these people postmodernists too where the individual doesn't really actually matter in the scheme of um social cohesion but in the same vent you have a kind of like you said a, like a purely self-interested and this comes from like you, why have faith in anything else when everything else is going like you can't trust anything else you get this cynical outlook of everything outside and you have this glorification of the self and then from that you get um and i see this with people i know is that you get this external locus of um oppression essentially everything that ha bad happens happens because of everything of stuff that happens outside of you right. and when you don't have faith in say something like um <clears throat> any transcendental thing like um a god or um, human nature even, when you're just even cynical about what people are, you, you tend to do that. Um, and to me, that faith is gone because 
we have oh nice um we have the um we've been for so long discounting what religion does and what faith and spirituality and whatever word you want to use has it has to offer because of um well the atheists have been very successful but the thing is that the atheism itself runs on faith to some extent because we're taking it on authority that there is no god now we haven't seen a god in space between the orbit of the earth and the moon but what happens when you go beyond the uh, cosmic horizon what's out there we don't know <laughs> <laughs> mathematicians don't know and that's there's still room for that in the universe and i think what you're saying is is very true but i think it oh sorry yeah, go on no i, I could go on forever go on. <laughs> I think it also rings true to what you say about social media having a big impact on that because like the way people are projecting themselves on social media and what they're doing is they're getting that like endorphin or dopamine surge from all the likes and the shares and all the attention they grab from others and the people in their circles. So it's like their social media presence is almost trying to deify their own self rather than having some existential metaphysical guideline that defines the self for which you post on social media it's almost like backwards now social media is des divine uh designing yourself and then yourself is creating some really bad skewed twisted sort of spirituality based on your popularity well, you get, like, facebook morality essentially instead of like legitimate morality which takes time and effort to like christianity had an, a morality where you go in and you you know sit down and you say ah i did i did this thing that i'm guilty about why did i do it am i immoral and the priest is like not really but maybe try and be nicer to people and then you have this morality which has come from a place you know if you want to chant if you want to channel burke uh we've had societies use this for thousands of years we shouldn't be throwing out the baby with the bathwater. i think is that what you're saying um, yeah, and uh, I just, uh, you know, to add to your point, uh, uh, with the idea of, uh, uh, the importance of the self now and how that, uh, you know, is utilized on, on, um, social media and stuff like that. I, I think people are, are, are slowly being poisoned and, um, even our, our, our language is deteriorating. That's a totally different subject entirely, but, um, I just if you have if if you're looking to go online and you're getting your morality from other people and not uh you know a source such as you know the bible i'm just saying for uh an example for christians catholicism etc for the westerners uh but it just feels like people uh have completely stopped um listening to uh um you know, their uh, guidance. There's no guidance is what I'm trying to say. Well, the guidance know, is everyone else. It's a herd mentality guidance and there's no, you know. Well, we we do talk about that in, like, not, like in society, you're right. And I think one thing that um, the liberal experiment that we're going through in the last three, 400 years shows and was built upon was that you are an individual, yes. But you're an individual as part of a group. Right. Like you are an group, and you're not even an individual as part of one group. You're individual, like right now, we're three individuals, and we have to realize that we are acting as individuals, but within the context of, you know, the podcast. And we're all like, I'm an individual within the context of my marriage. I'm an individual within the context of my, the people that live on the block. I'm not, I can't just value myself over everyone else on the block. I do have to value myself. But, you know, if someone's house catches fire, I can't just go, well, it's their problem. I have to go <laughs> over there and help them uh, if I'm able to. And that's where the individual, like, I'm an individual who can help other individuals and I'm in relation to other individuals. And I think what you might be getting at is that, like, when you put yourself on Facebook, you're an individual, you're like, your avatar is what the individual becomes. and. um there was a podcast, uh, I think it was um, about a month or so ago, between, I think it was Eric Weinstein and Jordan Peterson, where they 
essentially talk about the psychological um, results from having a uh, relying on online avatars. But what happens essentially is um, not really referencing them, but go check that one out uh, if you're watching this, is that you're just an avatar. That's not actually you. And then when you come back, you are seeing yourself as that, but you're not really connected to anybody. You're, you're putting yourself as an individual part of a web, just kind of trying to gain say everyone else for, you know, look at my life, look how I am doing. But really, that's not life. Life is what you're doing right now and here. And when you remove that, everything else becomes kind of trivial. So you get stuff like, you know, I, I don't just follow Christianity. Like I, I'm an avid reader of Marcus Aurelius. Um, I really do enjoy Taoist philosophy. And you, I find that when you engage these, you know, um, meaningful texts, you gather yourself, oh, how should I be acting? Oh, I shouldn't be giving slanders uh, or people that just like poo poo people in the, at the office cooler. I shouldn't be giving them the time of day, but then you do. And so when you think that everyone's voice matters, um, no, sorry, I'm not going that way. But essentially what we're doing is we're treating, we're, we're not vetting what we say through a morality that we've cultivated through um, exposure to moral sets. We're vetting our morality through um, these constructs that we've built that really don't rely on morality and enforce kind of herd behavior rather than individual responsibility towards how you should be acting. So, you know, I think, I think that's a really good point. Jordan is the fact that there is no sense of individual responsibility anymore, especially, I mean, in a sense, especially with the younger generation, this Gen Z that's coming out, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of just that this kind of mentality and yeah, she the the person I'm about to talk about is a little younger, so I, I get that she hasn't matured enough to whatever. But so, uh, just a friend age. of mine from what's up? As long as she's of age. Yes. No. She, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, she was of age. Uh, I just used to work with her. I invited her over one time to uh, hang out or whatever. So she's. It's pretty late at night, like you know, two o'clock in the morning, whatever. And uh, we both smoked at the time. Um, I quit for a while. That's why I said that. Uh, Cigarettes or yeah, yes. Okay, that, that um, does change the conversation, though. So, <laughs> well, yeah, we were we were drinking too. So, like, we went outside. Um, I let her go first to to my patio, and she just hoofs open the door, slams it behind. Well, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa! It's two in the morning. She's like, yeah, but you're the one paying rent here. You should do what you want. I'm like. Yes, but that wasn't me. But what me. about everybody else that lives here? Don't you think they deserve to have a, the same respect given so they can sleep, so they are not waking up in the middle of the night because of my behavior or your behavior? That doesn't make any sense. It's a completely self-involved, only my self, only my life matters, and it's because people have built these avatars in their in their mind uh, online and to relate to what you're saying, and they there's no sense of you know, like if, if I do this one thing, uh, this affects someone else. Uh, that, that whole idea, it seems like it's just thrown out the window uh, when you go online. That, go, that speaks a lot to the comments and types of things that people choose to post too, right? Like I, po I post a lot about um, anti-Zionism, not anti-Jew, but anti-Zionist Jew. The ones that are displacing other human beings and killing them and murdering children on a beach for playing soccer. But like I have Jewish family that are definitely going to be offended by those types of statements. But I have a political, like a moral obligation personally to myself to be true to a real truth when there's a travesty occurring, to speak out against it because it's wrong, just fundamentally on principle it's wrong, even though it's going to hurt other people. But there's this fine line of balancing between a poisonous online uh, um, like avatar, as you guys say, which I think is a really good way of putting it because it's not you. It's a caricature of you. It's like a cartoon yeah. version of you. All your features are exaggerated, all your best qualities and all the fun you have in your life and all the money you have if people post their nice cars and houses and stuff like that. But like maybe you could describe the poison. Like why is that so detrimental to people's sense of morality? 
the way they behave online and project the best of themselves at all times. Or even the worst without knowing it, I guess. In ignorance, they probably do both. Can you describe, like, the fire that spreads or the poison that makes it worse than uh, than a doctrine from a, tech, a religious book? Well, I... I think it's it spreads a lot easier, and and, and uh, those uh, those tendrils kind of reach into a lot more than uh, just a few aspects. I mean, um, what is what is real life anymore? And like everything you do is online, um, so that's where people live in. And this fact that like when you're online, you have a certain anonymity. Uh, anonymity. I can't. Talk. What's that word? Anonymity. Chris, help me out. There you go. Thank you. I always get tongue tied with that. But the enemies. <laughs> but the fact that remains is 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 because of that um, way that people can communicate without any holds barred. Uh, you know, they can say whatever they want because they're just strangers. Who cares? It's online. It's a space. They'll never meet these people. So there's a sense of like entitlement just because of that that you can say and rip into whoever you want and there's no consequences and i think that's the worst part of all this is there's no consequences in in real life there's consequences if you choose morally to do something wrong there's consequences you go to jail you get in trouble with your spouse you do whatever but online there it's like the wild west out there well that's even more so than when it started because now we have these structures like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, whatever else. And now people are just, they've gotten to the point where, you know, they're just, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to leave it at the Wild West because that's pretty much what I wanted to say about that. But it's it's horrendous. <laughs> no, but you're, um, you're hitting on a good point because um, the online world doesn't work in this, with, along the same rules as um, this world does. Like the world that exists according to you know, physical laws, nature, the logos, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's... The world where you can do podcasts with no pants on. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, are you wearing pants? <laughs> so I'll just stand up right now and, <laughs> and whoever isn't wearing pants loses. Um, but uh, what happens online is that um, online there's a, you know, that old Penny Arcade thing that you mentioned where um, there's, a, there's an ancient Penny Arcade thing where it's just like anonymity plus you know, an audience equals total quad. And, um, that's, it was, it was seen then and is still true now, but in addition to being able to be a total quad without any, um, any repercussions, you get that morality can change depending on where you are and who you're talking to online. It doesn't matter. You can be anything you want, but in the real world, you are you, you have to be you and you have to be honest. You know, if anything, you know, to thine self be true. Mm. Uh, with I love that quote, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's just, you know, it's Hamlet, where he's mm. like, you know, if you're going to be any, you have to be, no, actually, that's Polonius. Uh, stolen from Plato, though. Let's be real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, maybe that's why they made Polonius say it. Um, but uh, the thing is, is that um, you can be whatever you want online, and nobody can tell you no or yes, and you can just leave. In the real world, um, if you want to have a say, if you want to do something like our faces are on what we're saying now, there are repercussions to every word we use. Um, and that's for the better right now we're putting up, um, and, uh, we are being, we're showing that whatever we say, we have to re be responsible with it, but we're still pushing forward and saying things that are going to make people uncomfortable. We're taking responsibility for that as individuals online. You can be whatever you want. You can be an Apache helicopter, you know, whatever part of the LGBT alphabet people you want to be. But, uh, in real world, you have to abide by, uh, the logos, the way the universe works that we don't have control over. And I think that, when people try and translate that morality or that lack of morality, which is very based on herd behavior, you know, it's like, Ooh, I'm not a, all Christians are stupid. Cause look how dumb they've been. But then, um, or all religions dumb. So I'm not even going to read it or all the enlightenment philosophers didn't know what they were talking about. And so I'm just going to disregard notions of like freedom and liberalism. So they don't, think about it because they just go around patting each other on the back and so they reinforce false moralities and that's i think to bring it back to faith 
is there's no room there's no need for faith when you know everything already so so let's let's put this uh flip this around for a second because that was a good segue into the next point i wanted to kind of bring up so before you do do you mind if i just comment on that yes go ahead chris sorry sorry bookmark that quickly i i yeah. just wanted to emphasize that you guys made a really really clear point that um i i'm not even sure that we realized we made what we're doing is we're attaching our sense of self directly from externalities and i think that's like really interesting so the way we're building our own awareness of ourself and our self-consciousness and being is the way we actively try to project our humanity into a digital realm. The same way that we tried to extract morality from a spiritual realm. But it's backwards. Mm. Like the feedback mm. cycle isn't coming from a doctrine of text that was refined and thought about and processed and philosophically uh, engaged. It's coming from a process of just I'm going to put this out and see what happens. Oh, no consequence. I'm going to put this out and see what happens. Oh, no consequence. And it's just this, mm -hmm. the, the feedback from it is all positive for the wrong reasons. Well, in the real world, if you get somebody who's like, I'm a Harley Davidson guy, I only do Harley Davidson things. And this happens. You get people who are like, you know, Leafs fans or something, or um, they build their identity around weed or like... I go to the range and there's range guys who are like, oh, everything and everything they do is informed by that. And that's an externality, but it doesn't explain them. So when someone says, yeah, but there's more to life and they challenge their identity uh, in, a, in an area that's outside of that, uh, you know, um, like anime culture or something like that, and it forces them, it challenges them. So they have to become more than just a Hollerly Davidson biker or an anime geek. Uh, and, but online, you don't have that and that's what I, I think is really neat about it though is because like in in person you have these these quirks that you do and and like body language and stuff that is part of your identity that you're you're spitting out accidentally constantly so mm -hmm. if you want to project yourself as a harley guy and in person you know nothing about cars you never talk about it and you joke about anime you can't really hide it but online you can control exactly the flow of information that comes from out of you so you know exactly what's going to... So I wanted to relate this quickly to like, imagine if you had a dog and you could create a tool that made the dog do whatever dogs want to do, like piss at every single tree stop. And then you just gave it tons of tree stops. So all it wants to do is piss, 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 because you're just overloading its lizard brain doing the things that it wants to do. That's so similar to like how some people get addicted yeah, to porn, gonna, for instance. Like the obvious... Where it's just constantly like, I get exactly what I want when I want it. And it's just purely the thing that triggers my reward. Well, they, then they go outside and try and talk to, to have girls that define your sense of it. self is really <laughs> like, don't worry, Joe, and there's uh, plenty of websites for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll let you move on. I just wanted to say, like, strictly speaking, that it, it was really interesting to me, like fascinating, just the way it was. What you guys put it when you yeah no that's a describing. that's a super good point chris um that's exactly i think that's exactly what's going on um so uh my next uh kind of question to both of you would be kind of flipping this around again looking at more of uh having a hardcore traditional sense of religion still uh putting you know yourself in that uh pair of shoes you know because of 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 how we've evolved uh towards technology and all this stuff i mean if you're still super ingrained in, in, in deep uh religious family background and what, what have you i mean is it antiquated now is that why we're kind of moving away is it still birthing or perpetuating well, uh, the bigotry racism you know uh for me a lot of that was the um, the reason a lot of Christianity went out of favor is because it became too dogmatic. Mm. Christianity in itself, in its like a lot of these religions too, um, were they have a good message, but then like uh, you know Taoism for essential for for example, it's like oh wow we have this great philosophy, and then you know somebody who doesn't really think about it too much will start like let's start drinking poison, and and we'll be immortal. Um, we'll or turn bleach. into will turn into swords yeah and but then you get people in christianity who are like no we have to codify every single aspect of life and uh and uh it becomes too 
removed from the message. But the thing is that right now there's a lot of people rediscovering these messages and interpreting them publicly. Um, and I think that's causing resurgence because one thing that these long form discussions are doing is allowing us to resurface. But when you get something like that, you only get a shallow representation of these things and it that's 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 just as useless as anything else <laughs> so uh my to... idea on it would be very like you said a lot of what i would like to say so i'll just add to it supplementary supplementarily um uh, i would suggest and this is just me positing a uh, conjecture not proven or anything but i would suggest that things that are harder to do are more worthwhile Raising kids is more worthwhile than fixing up a car, no matter anything what. Everything worthwhile is difficult. <laughs> and everything worthwhile is difficult. So having these long, philosophically deep, non-shallow dives into um, introspection and spirituality, I think just as a first point of note, is intrinsically difficult because you have to stop and think and take time and analyze yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's hard. And what the internet and technology has been doing, going back to sort of what Justin started with, is technology gives us the, the sense of the idea that everything should be quick and faster. Everything should be optimized and you should skip the cliff notes. Don't read the whole book. Just get the TLDR version. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, TLDR. Like all that, that whole, all that nonsense to me is the culture or the faith belief in, in um, te technology centers. That's the stuff that we're we're doing but we're not thinking about is corrupting us like from the inside out we're, we're being trained to expect a quick answer for everything when you google it or when we're becoming you want entitled. to know what your friends feel about something you make a post and you say you see who likes it who commented like all of this feedback response isn't isn't encouraging any any rumination or churning in the well, mind so and i think one this, of one of the things that religion does um that we're missing from it is uh, religion does provide a sense of community and it forces you to sit down and be like, uh, like you have to talk to the priest, you have to talk to the people at saying you actually have to sit down and talk to them. And it provides that, that place, um, even almost more so than the doctrine itself. Um, <clears throat> and you're forced to actually see someone. Um, and I think a lot of the, uh, cures, I think, for a lot of this stuff. Um, specifically, someone like Dr. Warren Farrell, who's saying, like, one of the things that families need, first of all, we need to have families again, because for some reason we've lost faith in that. Um, he said, Completely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's like, family dinner night needs to be a thing from day one in every family. No cell phones at the counter. Word. Why? Because you have to have that conversation. It You put faith, and it builds that faith in these structures of, like, and not just, like, metaphysical structures but like these abstract structures of the family and yourself with the responsible ties towards the structures so and it's just something simple as like talking with people and well one of the quotes that i that i really have lived my life by and I, you've probably remembered me saying this way back when is that anything free isn't worth what isn't worth what you pay for it and we have gotten too used to getting stuff that for free like in the stuff like communicating like hey are you are you there yeah i'll be there in 10 minutes and you just sit there and why can't people talk to anybody and uh you know you can just dial up a hookup or something but instead of you know going through the sport of wooing them and uh, which is way more fun and gratifying and we this quick fix mcdonald's culture um like we were is not it's it's we're not used to having these things but the thing is is that we still need to try and you still get that like a lot of other people are saying stuff like like the other thing is do things that are difficult because that's the only way you're going to survive uh you get people saying uh there's one that one guy is like discipline equals freedom you need to go out you need to suffer you need to have everything suck because it's too good. So you need to actually simulate suffering. <laughs> and so like, that's what studying is to me. Well, it was studying, but then <laughs> it's like we forced suffering. Yeah. Do you guys think that maybe, I just want um, to answer your question though. 
Oh yeah, sure. I, I didn't actually finish. Sorry. <laughs> oh, you had asked, "Is religion outdated?" And what I was getting at oh, yeah. with that well, whole fulfillment that? and everything is that's that's the emphasis of religion is finding fulfillment in all things. Mm -hmm. it's looking into the family, looking into the self, looking into your work, looking into the way that you conduct and construct also your your self image and the way you project yourself in the social world. But you're doing it slowly and methodically with a guideline. Whereas through technology, you're doing it based on an algorithm suggestions and your friends likes and shares. So like the emphasis changes from productive fulfillment to productive engagement, where you're just trying to get responses from people rather than having something worth responding to. So like, I don't think faith is outdated or antiquated. I think it needs to be updated, though. Like it, it's so useful in, in all in all of our lives and our, our self-image definitions, but it's not useful in the way that it's being presented. The, the traditional organ and hymnals and all that, you can keep it if people want it, but a lot of the most popular churches are the ones with electric guitars and big bands playing, and the speakers come out with emphasis and like production quality kind of thing. Like they're, they're entertainers. And you need that in an environment where everybody's constantly being fed entertainment. Everybody's trying to grab eyes and views and likes and shares. You need to have that type of engagement with people, but also keep it traditional in the sense that you're still delving in deep into the, the core issues. So I don't think it's outdated. It just needs to be updated. And they're resistant to change. Like inherently, religions are resistant to change. That's why religions have persisted for centuries. Mm. But I think they need to change more quickly because of this environment with technology. No, that definitely makes sense. Um, actually, that's a great segue into what I was just going to ask before I uh, <laughs> interrupt you. Is we do um, it all the time. <laughs> so in regards to that, do you just think that maybe part of the problem is that we've just gotten too big as a society because we've moved online? Because, um, you know, back in the day, I mean, in the medieval times, we, we were run by church and state. That's just how things were. You know, every... Everybody was, a, uh, you know, if you're poor, <laughs> you're a serf or you're a, you know, peasant or what have you, and everything was run by the church, and now nothing is run by the church. And I think that flip-flop um, has really given people uh, um, this this freedom, which I think is a good thing. I mean, I don't think everyone should be forced into, you know, that kind of lifestyle, but I mean, it also begets a lot of... Um, yeah, like what we were talking about earlier with toxicity and, and the fact that everyone is so self-righteous now and indignant, it's just drives me nuts. <laughs> so one of the things, the medieval period, the church was the state. Well, essentially, um, the church and the popes and princes were fighting each other too for who was going to be the state. Right, right. Um, but a lot of that was because um, you have this bastardization of what the – of the use of faith and you end up with something that was inherently evil. I don't think religion in itself is bad. Now faith and reason itself are shoes that you need. You need both of them or you're, you're going to get further with both than you will with just one because you, you can only reason yourself so far at, at some point you need to have hope and you need to have something to aim for um, some personal greater good. And you need faith in that because, you know, you need to have faith that you're going to have lunch, even though you can't know that you're actually going to be able to get to lunch. Um, so we we work on faith. And I think the fact that we've forgotten how um, – oh, jeez, you made good points and I've forgotten your initial question uh, – just, I can reiterate I think it if we've you got want. Too yeah. big for faith is what he was talking. Yeah, about. Oh, yeah. that was it. Yeah. So yeah. now, um, yeah. So I think the thing is, is that we're not too big for this. I think we're still now. There's just more people, but it's just more people like that also need to get themselves together, and it's just we're not too big for it because now we have more hands, and if if more people now get um, themselves in a place where they are, uh, I don't want to use the word sorted, but that's so good as one as everything, but um, into a more mature 
place like in their the life. Organization. Yeah. Right? But it's not even organization. If more people, like we have more hands now, and if more hands are put towards benevolent use because they are seeing some greater good, not like greater good as in like, you know, uh, like hot fuzz type thing, but like greater good as in like, you know, help your neighbors. Uh, like, you, 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 or like if you have an, a, like if my tomato plant makes a ton of extra tomatoes, I'll go to my neighbors and be like, I have extra tomatoes. Do you want some? And that's something you can do because I believe in the intrinsic, like I have faith in a humanist sort of way, which can be considered another religion. Um, a, I have faith in humanity, uh, to some extent, and I will help humans, uh, because of that. And, I don't think the fact that we're too big, and I think people use the overpopulation as an excuse. Oh, I'm meaningless. They want to see themselves as a hero. They want to, and because of Facebook, they want to see themselves and their avatar right up there on YouTube with 100 million views, and everyone's saying, "Oh my God, you're so great! I love you!" <laughs> and, and money coming at them, and they get sex and rewards, and you know, in the history books. But none of that matters. What matters is, and I've said this before in the podcast, um, is that are you a good person? How do you treat your parents? How, what kind of person are you to your wife and your children and your neighbors? Do you present, do you have, like, do you clean up your yard because you know that your neighbors will enjoy? And this gets back to a point you made about like an hour ago. It's like you have to think about others when you're thinking about yourself. Like, I don't just clean up my yard so I have a pretty yard. I clean up my yard because my neighbors are going to be looking at my yard too. And they're going to have, you know, a better day if they don't look over and be like, oh, that yard's so ugly. You know, and if I clean it up and they think it's ugly, that's not my problem. That's themselves not having, uh, looking on the wrong side. And I keep coming back to the individual because it doesn't matter how big we get. If we fill up the solar system with another like 3 billion people, if all those 3 billion people are, you know, generally on the side of well-adjusted, then what does it matter? <laughs> so, um, I think... I think a big part of that too... Sorry, did I cut you no, off? No, no, no. I... Yeah. I think a big part of that too is um, we've always thought we were too big. While, like, we're reaching frontier after frontier after frontier. Mm. You think Africa's overpopulated because the whole world is desert except for this one little breadbasket. And then you find out that there's like all of Europe, all of Russia, all of India. And you're like, oh, nobody could live here. And then a billion people pop up in China and Russia or uh, India. And then we think, oh, Jap Japan's a tiny island. Like, there's no way we could support more of these people. And sure enough, lo and behold, we've got the biggest city in the entire planet is Tokyo. So we always think we're at the end of where we can go with our, our progression as a species, and we're always wrong. Then we find the new world, right? So I think... Or we learn to increase population. crop yields by like 300%. Like yeah. in the Middle Ages, we were doing crop yields of one or two to four per seed, So, uh, which is insane because now we're doing 80 to 100 per seed, which mm -hmm. like that's immense. And we don't even think that's the end of it. If we start doing like high yield tier, like if we start building up vertical, instead of build, farms. vertical farming and underground farming, like we could feed everyone forever. <laughs> yeah, and you could use geothermal energy from the underground because it's hotter in mine shafts when you go deep down. You can use that energy with like a Stirling engine or a geothermic pump or something and create lights to grow plants underground and not even use your topsoil. Yeah. So if you think about how much land we use right now for, for farming alone, like you just being it? able to go underground, yeah, it's more expensive. Well, it's more. Well, you want to build with it. More people, you have well, the arms and the hands to do it. Getting back to what Jordan said, is well, like what do you want to build it of? We want to build it out of carbon. Pull it out of the atmosphere. Now yeah. we have like use carbon capture to pull it out of the atmosphere. And build buildings with that, and okay. like we numbers have numbers help with synergies though i think that's what you were getting to that's the thing yeah and that's kind of like i keep harping on matt ridley but that's essentially one of his points is that more people means more connections and more ideas have sex and the more ideas that have sex we get more idea babies and these so and that's how i feel as an economist because markets work the same way everything is compounded off of one effective market helps another industry develop another market that creates more synergy for all markets around it so right. I think the bigger we get, the more efficient we'll get at improving everyone's life. 
as long as we have a moral fiber to to focus our energies towards benevolent goods. Right. That's the but. The but is we have to put up as individuals. And that's kind of where we come back to Justin's point where like we can't be these self-interested, self-centered people. We have to put the work in into becoming better. Um, <laughs> like you need to suffer a bit because then you'll only know uh, what other people suffering. And that's the thing though. I remember people stomping on my apartment roof and I'm like, man, I'd hate it if someone stomped on my roof. So it's like, you know, when I'm running around in my apartment, I'm like, okay, you know what? I hate this. I don't think of it like that. I'm not some like hoity toity goody goody who's like, oh, well, I don't like it. I better follow the golden rule. No, I'm thinking like it just kind of happens and I kind of do it as a matter of course now because I know that's the best. When my neighbors are happy, that means I'm happy and everyone's benefiting. Yes, it's self interested, but it's enlightened self interest. And I think that's better than, um, and it's it's it sounds cynical, but it's really not, because this enlightened self interest means you know that you're out for yourself, but you can still help others because in helping others you help yourself, and I think that's what a lot of religion actually tried to tell us. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's, that's. So, what do you think, Justin? How big are we? I well, I was just going to speak to what he just said. Um in regards to self-preservation i mean that's just like an innate human trait um and and i do the same thing by the way in my own apartment uh even though my neighbors sound like african elephants upstairs, <laughs> i consciously i know that the person below me is this disabled guy and he's probably in his 60s 70s so I, the last thing i want to do is be that noisy ass neighbor who's constantly pounding and he, he can't do anything about it because he's just stuck down there right he can barely even walk right so anyway um i i definitely uh, appreciate that and uh believe no, that as well but that's good because you have knowledge of your neighbor enough to understand and that's it's, it sounds hokey and corny but like you have enough knowledge of this man to understand to to give some sort of empathy towards him and that's like it's so simple you did it without thinking but you did it just now <laughs> and that's key and it's kind of like when we're online you're not meeting those people that you're living with because like you're meeting people online which is you know communicating with people is generally on on average better but you need to talk to your neighbors because you're living right like the vicinity you your physical yeah. Yeah, yeah there's no ignore button yeah <laughs> so like having a like i'm in edmonton so the you know everyone's got one of those like giant trucks with a huge like blah, blah, blah thing on it oh, and it's just like it's, it's 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 exactly what you were talking about before where like they don't think about it they're thinking about oh yeah i'm screwing everyone over but they yeah. don't know anybody they think like so it's the same thing uh out, out back in my parking lot with the these massive stereos in their cars or jeeps or, or beamers or what and like you don't understand bass doesn't work like it's just self-contained in your car i can hear it through my apartment walls when i'm trying to sleep that's how loud and and how much it carries it just kind of spreads out it doesn't just stay in your car like and it's not making anyone want to sleep with you <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly i could sue him for uh lack of uh sexual desire over here because of this uh but anyway seriously though um no i i think uh i think you guys both made really good points about that um i just i just feel that that because uh we have spread out so much as uh and and especially in the in the digital age that uh i just feel like people just don't have time for stuff like that they be to what chris was saying uh with the constant dopamine uh requirement and and you're getting that constantly from facebook and everything has to be now 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 there is no uh uh you know introspection anymore i don't think and i think the the lack of introspection based on other people's opinions of you and and what how much you value that has seriously led people to these these deep brooding depressions um i'm not saying literal depressions i'm just saying that their overall outlook on life no but uh, you're right because that's yeah. covered um very deeply in um jonathan hates and lukyanov's coddling of the american mind um, mm. which is a great book everyone is listening should go and read it because he mm. does detail in 
in, from a psycho, social psychologist perspective, the impact, the psychological impact of these services on our uh, children's psychology. And it's like he says, like boys will just shove it off, but like the impact on girls is actually really bad. But we can't, so we still can't discount the impact on boys because like boys aren't allowed to, you know, fight and make up anymore either. So because or speak their feelings because they don't have the same connections that women do that enable them to speak more articulately. Like right. we are as men less articulate by birth than women. And that's just a fact of our biology. I'm not that's saying like, every man can't speak, but it's harder for us, us inherently. To well, speak. they're telling well, they're telling us not to cry, but at the same time, they're not letting us fight. And the way men yeah. deliver stuff <laughs> is we have a bit of a fist fight. Uh, you know, we're angry, we're sad. We, we just like, and we have a bit of, we go, we go up and we confront the person and then, you know, there's a fight. And then those two guys go grab a beer together <laughs> because... We shared feelings. <laughs> 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 yeah, you beat our chest at each other, and like, yeah. And I think a lot of the other thing is that, uh, well, I don't know if I want to get into that, but essentially, to your point, is that there is psychological, uh, there are psychological conditioning to all this. Uh, the mm -hmm. About a couple of years ago, the one of the creators of Facebook came out and said, don't use Facebook. You don't know what it's doing to you. We actually tracked this. We're not telling you because, you know, money. So he stopped working for them and just came out and was like, don't use Facebook, you idiots. <laughs> Do you know what it's doing to you? <laughs> like, we did that intentionally. <laughs> so, And to sort of get back to the, the religion aspect of it, it sort of brings me back to what I was trying to, um, trying to say about like the fulfillment aspect of life. And the thing that religion gives people, and most people that are subscribed to uh, one type of faith or another, like I grew up Christian, like devout, went four or five times a week for the first 12 years of my life, 14 years of my life. So... I was very ingrained in, in the culture and the society and in that mindset. But the biggest thing you get out of that is like Jordan had also alluded to the, the sense of community and like how it socializes kids to um, treat respect to adults and elderly and things like that. The things that they're not talking about in the sermon, but just as you're congregating with a congregation of people, well, it helps you understand importance. social interaction. And missing that, especially during like a COVID pandemic where everybody's in lockdown, kids not only don't have the church as their community and socialization service, they have the opposite. They have nothing but social media and advertising constantly bombarding their brains with this instantaneous loop of buy this, get this, do this, be this, instead of like discovering what this is. Like there's no emphasis on like, you should sit and look at that ad for 15 minutes and s decompose the structure of how they designed it and how they timed the motions and the animations and why they chose this word instead of that word. But like when they say this oh. lettuce tastes fresh, why didn't they just say it's fresh? Cause it's not, they have to say it tastes fresh. So it's not false advertising. But when you just like negligently let that stuff in your brain and just say, Oh, they said the word fresh. I'm skimming. I understand it all. I go to Lamborghini and I read books. <laughs> when, you, when you go that approach to everything you see as you're growing up, you become an adult who only thinks that other people have answers that they have to memorize and, and, and hold well, rather than developing answers that they can have from, for themselves. Well, and that shows when you go to church and you sit there, like you said, uh, it shows it's instilling a sense in our, in our, in our children that there are things in the world that are more important, that are important to be uh, grave about. So, you know, to have gravitas. There are things that are more important than them. You're sitting in church and it's telling you this is a time of being serious. You, like there's something important here. Pay attention. And, you know, you're saying, okay, there's something important here. So you listen and it's like you learn a lesson. And then afterwards, everyone goes around and, you know, goofs off because you're, you're telling your students – not students, but the congregation and the students too, that there are times when we need to sit down and be serious as fucking. <laughs> and there's times where we don't. Because, you know, if you notice a good priest will be very, uh, he'll switch. And I think that's also very important because right now a lot of this leads to um, a very 
distinct form of nihilism where it's like, oh, nothing's worth taking important. Like every, yeah, nothing's generally sacred, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't treat things as if they're sacred. So like, oh, nothing matters. It's like, well, duh. But like, maybe you sh what happens if you do treat them as if they do matter? See what happens. You'll be surprised. So when you're sitting in church is almost training for taking things in life seriously when they need to be taken life to taken seriously. Um, because if you don't take anything seriously, then how are you going to take yourself seriously? How are you going to take a marriage seriously? How are you going to take friends seriously? So, uh, what do you think? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a certain amount of dignity that we've lost for sure. That's a really good word for it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, even, you know, you're saying like when you're actually going to a, a place of worship, whatever it may be, and, and there's that uh, talk with whoever, um, there's, uh, there's a real uh, uh, palpable feeling that you're, you're confronting life and these really hard, you know, decisions, situations, whatever you're going through. And now it's like, I mean, do people even... Uh, they don't even have a concept of like what life is anymore. I don't believe. Well, life is intrinsically part of like, you know, it's like life, but you go to church and they say, the first thing that they're going to say, like you walk in and what's the first thing you see? Uh, and like the iconography. The I, I mean, it depends a, what kind of church, but like generally you're going to see the picture of a guy dying on a piece of wood. Sure. Um, <laughs> in um uh in most religions have some element of like how does death work and i think a lot of it in the social media is that we're stunting ourselves because we're not tending to these um hard questions how are you gonna do like how are you gonna die and like you read someone like marcus aurelius who's like here's how to die you read a lot of the Eastern mythology, not mythology, mythology, but yeah, but the um, philosophies and religions, they're like, here's how you can die because it's going to happen and you have to do it right because if you, you, you can't really live unless you are aware of the fact that you are this temporary being um, and like a lot of guys in these ancient cultures are like, you need to be aware of this. And you're well, it's kind of like the um, the old Fight Club thing. Like you need to realize that one day you will die, and until you know that, you are useless. Well, what is he saying there? And that's what a lot of these religions do. They force you in a grave manner to sit down, shut up, and think about this thing you don't want to think about or talk about with anybody. And Facebook saying like this or only happy things, and we're going to delete anything that's slightly problematic. And we're going to curate this so everyone's having the best life possible. So guess what? No one's having the best life possible. Everyone's just having I, their life. <laughs> oh my god, I hate that expression, live your best life. Like, I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. I hate it so much. <laughs> it's, it's such a vagary and it's such a really shallow way to say like, you know, it, it, there's no try your best. There's no work hard. There's no, you know, have respect and and self-respect for for yourself and everyone else it's lead your best life you know like you want yeah. that ice cream or that box of ice cream and you're overweight fuck it lead your best life you know what i mean like there's this just I this remember, nolo <laughs> I, there was a like a couple like about a year ago one thing i did was you know my parents are living this comfortable life and they're probably not going to watch this so whatever mm -hmm. um and they're just sitting there watching tv all day so what I do is I climbed a mountain <laughs> and on the peak of that mountain, I FaceTime them. And the thing is, is that getting up that mountain was excruciating. It was absolutely hell. Like I had a pack on it. My legs were killing me. My, uh, my wife was yelling at me. <laughs> Why do we have to do this? But like, and we, I got to the top and I FaceTimed my parents and the contrast was instant. They're sitting there watching TV and I'm like, yo, I'm on a mountain. <laughs> That's the thing. Like I don't, I don't do like all those push-ups every day because I like doing push-ups. I like 
the result of what I get when I do push-ups. I like the result I get from reading the book, from reading something I don't even like to read. I, I like like you do something and like that is hard because not because, you know, it's you enjoy doing it, but because there you have faith, and this is coming back to it, that whatever is gonna come after this work will be better than had you not suffered. And yeah, I think that's kind of like you get to pick your sacrifice, but you don't get to not make one. As, uh, a lot of that to me comes say. down to maturity because like delayed gratification yes. is something we have to teach kids. And this again is something biologically that's different between boys and girls that you can measure with like the, the common test was the marshmallow test. You oh, yeah. put a kid in a room and they say, <laughs> you can eat the marshmallow. But if you don't eat the marshmallow, by the time I come back in five minutes, I'll give you two marshmallows. Some kids are just incapable of waiting for two marshmallows. It's they right there. Give marshmallow. it to me. <laughs> yeah. And they'll look around and they'll touch yeah. it, they'll poke yeah. it, they'll like move it, they'll look away. Like they'll well, do all kinds of crazy shit to avoid eating a marshmallow. And, and we're not, not even talking about like, you know, a year from now, what your health is like from doing push ups. We're talking about a marshmallow that's five minutes <laughs> yeah. in front of you. No. Out. And like a game theorist might say like yeah a kid will inherently just be like yeah marshmallow but then like the the guy comes in and says oh you screwed up you took the marshmallow instant gratification sucks doesn't it and then they learn it's like oh if i play the game differently and they learn because that's the thing game theory and all these like uh conditioning theorists and behavioralists will say P like you're not inherently evil like some people will be have a bent towards like uh you know cheating and stuff like that but um there is biologically determined stuff but at the same time you still have enough free will to be like two marshmallows <laughs> <laughs> you know what I, I i really think that um i have a theory about that experiment and yes there's a personality level to it where people are just more impatient than other people i totally understand that right but here. i've <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a certain amount of impatience myself. Um, but I have a feeling that those kids that instantly needed that marshmallow, I think more had to do with how they're raised. Um, and I'm not saying just morally or, or not or whatever or um, You're completely right. Typically, I'm saying but uh, it relates directly to what we're talking about is I think those are the kids who were raised on iPads versus the kids who their parents don't do that. Well, I think you're going to get more of a distribution towards it from the kids because there's always going to be that one kid is going to be like, oh. of course, that's why I said uh, the like, uh, at the same factor. time, though, like I'm an impatient guy. Mm -hmm. I got married and my wife knows I'm an impatient guy. But mm -hmm. being in this new relationship, being an individual within this greater relationship and having faith in that relationship makes it so that my deficiencies in um, what do you call that? Uh, patience uh my deficient patience uh is <laughs> offset by my wife who can keep me in line and then being in and by putting effort into that relationship i can offset we can, we both offset each other's um deficiencies which is also the reason why we're doing this podcast as three people and not one of us just sitting on there being like here's what i think blah 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 and then right you know, Right, and which so, is most of YouTube right now. Yeah, <laughs> some right. Trolls for this type of content. I see a lot of people come on YouTube and just write scripts and read their scripts and tell you what they know as fact. It's like, oh, these guys are very well spoken. It's like, wait, no, they wrote this out. <laughs> it's like people are reading for the pat on the back for having read now, though, rather than people reading because they privately and personally want the information for the rest of their lives in their judgments and and recollections and you know interpretations of other situations they want that they, we don't do that anymore we read because a school told us to read this book we yeah. memorize parts of this book so we get this test so that this test can give us this grade so that this grade can give us this accreditation so we can get this job with this pay well, like I remember it's reading, all prescribed right down to the end and i think I that's a reading, horrible way to live your life i remember have, reading foucault it was never assigned foucault was never assigned in school hey guys just one second i'm just oh. gonna be right back i just have to use the washroom okay, okay. And i remember yeah well i remember reading it yeah, take us with you that's on record now <laughs> <laughs> and i remember oh, reading right. it turn the mute 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 
Oh, you fucking guy. <laughs> Peace. Sorry, go on. Yeah, I remember reading Foucault, and <laughs> it's too funny. Uh, there we go. <laughs> fuck it, I'm never going to finish this. Are you in the washroom? No. Can you be? No. <laughs> <laughs> Watch, he flips the camera down so it looks down. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you were reading Foucault, never assigned. Yeah, it was never assigned because they never assigned it because it was too hard. And, you know, also the same thing with Marx. They never assigned Marx, but they would always talk about him. And I finally read it, got through it painstakingly, but it was like in addition. And I found myself instantly at an advantage to everyone who's, you know, in invoking him. But like this... And I've met so many students who were just like, oh, I'm just, just going to do the reading that I was assigned. I'm just going to do this. And then they end up not knowing what they're talking about. And then when they invoke their philosophy, I'm ahead of them because I just went outside, slightly outside the boundary and read Plato's Republic or Foucault or Marx or um, Locke, all these people who were never assigned because they're too hard. Um, and I, I found that astounding. And it got worse and worse as my uh, my my career there uh, kept going, and eventually it was just like I found myself walking over these these students, and it's like it was almost too easy because they weren't fighting back, <laughs> and then they would talk behind my back, and because that was easier than confronting me as a thing because they didn't have faith in themselves; they were just doing what they were told. And I think there's a lack of appreciation for the fulfillment, though, that long term mm -hmm. gain that people aren't working towards. I think yeah. that's used to be the focus of university was this is going to take you a while to get smarter. And this is why, because long term fulfillment is worthwhile. But mm -hmm. now that we've changed it to a jobs training platform, it's it's become this um, this mechanic. You're a cog. You spin this way. You get this result. And I, I think that's horrible for the for the not just the culture, but like the species, the way we innovate and design and self organize and the way that we use our efficiencies to benefit everybody are being misused in the sense that when I go and take a written course, because they need certain, you know, certain courses to get part of a faculty, you need a written, you need a couple electives, then you need some compulsories, whatever. I took world Rel religion as a written and the, one of the major essays we had to do was the whole subject was just what is religion. So I threw in Islam, I threw in Christianity, philosophy, I threw in a whole bunch of etymology and epistemology. And it was completely flat out rejected, like my draft that I sent them just to see if I was on the right course, because I'm one of those like, I do things like the day it's assigned kind of thing. Yeah. And my prof was like, completely wrong. Absolutely not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is read the text that was assigned. And from that, tell me what is religion. And I'm like, yeah, that's not education. I'm I not got, learning fuck all by I just that, regurgitating someone else's concepts I just so that, you can feel okay about reading and grading it. Like, I, I took that same class and I had to do a similar uh, like the year after or so. And I remember I did the assignment and I went all out on my analysis and I did it like a full research paper and it was only like a five, 10 page paper. And I got 95% and a letter saying you should join the religion faculty. You showing a lot of promise, but you lost 5% for not using the text I assigned. <laughs> so it was just like, maybe it was a bad paper then, or maybe it was a bad assignment, but well, like what crushed me. I got a B plus for formatting. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know a four or a five formatting because I didn't take the course that teaches you how to take courses because it was never compulsory. But like the requirements are so not on education. The requirements are entirely hinged upon what exactly the the uh, well, the and they're also hinged the on keeping the students happy at all times and making them feel like they're doing good instead of like they need to fail students. They need to have them like the thing is that like one of the things about Christianity is that they tell you you go to church and they say you're gonna screw up. And you're going to screw up tomorrow and you screwed up yesterday. We're all inherent. Like we have original sin, which is essentially just them saying like, you're too stupid to not make mistakes. We all are. And you're too stupid to not just randomly accidentally do evil. So, and they take it too far and say, you need to repent forever. And it's like, well, no, you need to make good by it. You need to realize that and maybe work harder. But the thing is, is that 
they are telling all these students and all these kids nowadays that's like, no, no, it's okay. You're perfect just the way you are. In fact, whatever you say you are is perfect. And just let us know who you think you are and we'll do that. Would, would you like a would you like a cupcake? <laughs> would you like, like to redefine the ling- English language so that we can include pronouns that never existed before? Or would you, would you like and to And which are made up on the spot these days? Like, I can't even keep up with them. It's ridiculous. Well, there's no point. <laughs> no. Yeah, there's no point. Like, it doesn't fix anything. It doesn't help communication. It doesn't help us learn. It doesn't help us aggregate our, our, our thoughts or, um, or like, uh, or self or, um, what do you call that? Jeez. Uh, cooperate. It doesn't Ooh. help us cooperate whatsoever. All it does is spawn tension. Like, the point of saying he and she was never to, like, minimize or grandiose some some concept that you're about to speak of. It was just like, we need something just so that you know what we're appropriating a subject and an action to. Let's just use the shortest thing we can, a two-letter word. Well, one of the, like, pick one. One of the <laughs> things that I, I'm kind of going to go back to Jonathan Haidt was that um, he identified that a lot of the stuff, I think it was Haidt, no, it might have been another guy. Essentially, the idea was from one of these authors was that um, what's happening is a sort of a reverse cognitive behavioral therapy on our students. We're, we're subjecting this to you now. For those who don't know, cognitive behavioral therapy is essentially identifying what's causing you suffering. Okay, that's you don't like this, and because a lot of people will obfuscate and they'll say, "Well, no, I don't like because I don't like the guy who's in charge of my municipality or something," and that's giving me a lot of stress. No, no, no. You're, you're, you're not doing your job properly or you're doing this or you're afraid of going into traffic. It could be something as that. It's like, this is psychology. You know, it doesn't always have to make sense, but you always have to deal with it. So, you know, you're afraid of traffic and you're blaming it on something stupid. So you, you say, okay, yes, I am afraid of going into traffic because I'm afraid of car accidents. So then you face it and you reformat, you, you reconceptualize everything in your brain and painstakingly so that you can drive in traffic. So you can approach this. So you can do it differently. So you're changing your view to accommodate reality so that you can work within reality more effectively. And that's Rather than odd. changing the situation, you change your point of view, your perspective of the situation. Right, exactly. So this is what the this is exactly the opposite of what's happening on social media and in the the current culture is that we're we're telling people that no no, the world has to change for you. You exactly. And so then so then to go back to the original point again, religion doesn't make any sense in that context because, you know, and then God said, and it was so, and you were a part of that, that, that thing, that logo said, I keep talking about the way that reality exists from God's word. And so it's the same thing within all the religions um, where you are accommodating yourself to the world to work within it more properly. Um, this is what the Tao is. Um, this is... Um, shows up in a lot of religions but essentially we've decided we just no throw that out because you know you can make up whoever you want i'm a i'm a i'm a i'm a dragon lizard (laughs) filipino 40 year old woman except i'm a (laughs) yeah um the 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 issue that i have is when we started i don't don't know exactly when this started but we we began putting a, a a spotlight on all of these really uh you know small groups of people these really niche uh parts of society when of course everyone needs a voice i love how part of this issue is actually inclusion as well as the worst part of it because Mm -hmm. if you make everyone inclusive of course that's ultimately a good thing but now you're making these groups the biggest spotlight that we have out there like Yes, I believe Black Lives Matter. Yes, I believe that trans people should have rights. Yes, I believe that gay and lesbian, uh, LGBTQ, XYZ <laughs> community should have all the rights that they need to be healthy uh, and productive members of society. But when we completely overwhelm our the norm with these really niche groups, that's when I have a problem. When you're compelling my speech because of of... of the way that you live your life like how does that have anything to do with me i'm giving you my respect you don't need to do that the other way what's wrong with the word everybody everybody has the right to say what they want in society well well, what about me it's like everybody well everyone has the right to 
free movement. Everyone has the right to religion, whatever you want. And like without interference of the state. Well, what about my religion? We said everybody. Well, what if I want to, you know, sacrifice children? Okay, wait, maybe we have a problem there. So not that one. Uh, well, actually, you can practice that as long as you don't kill children. Um, but like, and that's the funny thing. Like, getting sorry, getting back to what yep. Justin had mentioned there on like spotlights of small groups. I think that's absolutely critical because what we're doing, even with news with climate change, is that they're pretending that they're giving an equal voice to both sides of the argument. But what they're doing is the one side that has all the body of evidence and all of the the researchers and the smartest people in your country. You're putting them on an equal playing field with the flat earthers. And that's just not responsible because what you're doing is you're showing the public that, hey, there's a valid opposition to climate change. And there, there isn't. There just flat out is no valid opposition. You're allowed to believe it. You're allowed to promote it. But they're amplifying the voices of these tiny groups of people who feel victimized or oppressed well, yeah. and they're telling everybody that it's everybody's problem. Well, and then like, if you criticize, you have human rights, like you said, everybody is everybody. You already have the right to self determination. You don't need to have the right as a specific group member for self determination because you already have it as a human being. It's an inalienable right. Well, uh, so... and it makes it so you can't criticize it because if I say, like, like I'm definitely a bit of a tree hugger, but I definitely am extremely critical of people like uh, like Greta Thunberg because I like I want to see. Uh, how dare you how dare you <laughs> but like i i feel like like you can't criticize it if you say something against one aspect of environmentalism then you must be an anti-environmentalist it's like no i grow trees upstairs so i can go out and plant them like yeah. i like i am very pro like dealing with this environmental crisis i don't disbelieve it just because i don't like you know something like everything's open to discussion and I and that goes back to the confrontation thing. You know, you silo someone, and so they become their avatar instead of their um, instead of their reality. There's right. no nuance. It's just. I actually, I actually had a thought yesterday after me and Chris had talked about our previous uh, topic, and I, there's a another part to that as well that uh, people are completely ignoring is like, so. You're born in a hospital, wherever it is. You're you're given a, a male or female um, identity based on your junk. The doctors don't care how you feel because you don't have feelings. Yet. You're a little infant that has no feelings and Blob no thought. Poop. <laughs> so now that you go into an age, 13, 14, 15, even as young as that, um, where oh no, uh, you, you, you're not privy to that information or I identify as this and that and whatever. Yeah, but I can't tell what you are because some people are ambivalent the way that they look. They, they're androgynous. And so if I'm trying to treat you as a physician, as a, as a per, uh, person practicing medicine, and you're not even going to cooperate in that uh, level where you're going to tell me what sex you are or how you're supp you, you properly identify as like, you know, physically, then I, I just, it's like actually fucking up people's uh, diagnosis. My, my wife point. is dealing with this at work where she, you know, she has to ask them, it's like, how did you, how did your gender present at birth? And if they get offended about that, it's like, I, I actually need to know this because exactly she, she's working yeah. as a pharmacist and like, she needs to know because if you are, you know, a male at birth, you could have some messed up uh, interactions with your drugs and the thing is is that um it does matter uh like you can't just be like oh no i don't i think science is only one way of knowing therefore um you know i can just believe these drugs will work in the way i want i'll just or you know i'll just put frequencies into my body that'll uh make them work better in fact i don't even need the medication it's like Okay. And the thing is that causes harm, that causes a social yeah. harm, and people's lives are less productive, less fulfilling, and you're not fixing a problem. Like, there's never been a problem with somebody. Maybe they have a personal issue, but it's never been a social problem having gender identity as a question. Like, it's not an offensive thing to say, do you have hair? Do you have white skin or dark skin? Do you How have slanty eyes? How dare you? <laughs> like, if somebody looks like me, I should be able to say, I'm... I have um, 
ancestral roots in, in Jews and Spanish and Jamaicans and whatever I come from. Like, it makes absolutely no difference to speak something that's valuable and true to a physician who's treating something that is real and material. Whether you identify with something is separate from what you, what you physically um, manifest as. But again, I've never heard that issue come up. I've never heard a trans person say, like, my whole day was screwed because somebody asked me my gender. It's I've just, had, it's never been an issue. I've encountered like, that before. But the fact that we're talking about <laughs> it on a believe? podcast... They're yeah. amplifying the small group of people who want to feel this victimhood over nothing, and they're amplifying it as if it's everyone's problem, and you're wasting resources, time, and energy of everyone trying to correct a problem that doesn't exist. I I'm not saying discrimination doesn't exist, but I'm saying there are already personal discrimination laws that fix that and correct it. So, like, if that's your issue, take it to the Human Rights Tribunal. Take it to court. Or do whatever I would do if somebody discriminated against me as being a white man. I would take the exact same recourses. I don't need special resources or no. resources or actions. You see, Chris, that, that really speaks to a, a very uh, interesting point that you're saying is I think all of these things that we're talking about is directly spitting in the face of our traditional sense of, uh, of uh, what we worshipped uh, previously and what we're doing right now in this digital age is forming our own uh religions whether it be victimhood or um you know gaslighting yeah anything yeah. you want to have that that's what your religion is now I, I, and i don't think that we're necessarily moving away from these uh traditional roots that we've established over centuries and millennia uh no matter what religion you're part of or what group you think you belong to is i think people are establishing so heavily in their sense of self and their avatar online and their victimhood and their uh, their bravado basically is their personal uh sense sense of self-worth is so huge now that they can't even see the forest from trees and i think that is the problem i think that is the root of it is people well, are you're describing something that i've definitely noticed and i haven't really brought it to the podcast yet but i've I've definitely seen this, like I, I like I see a historical perspective a lot. But one of the things I've noticed is that since about the French Revolution or um, Rousseau, I don't want to just point at Rousseau for this. You know, you could point at Diogenes or something if you want, but uh, if you want to go that far back. But over the po course of the last like 250 years or so, one thing we've seen is a move away from those traditional values. So you see the the the, the, the discussion between Payne and Burke in um, in the Revolutionary period. Um, you see uh, Rousseau and Locke; these two things. So you get this rationalism versus like we need to feel, I need to make whatever up, and then eventually we started rejecting all this stuff. And right now, what's happened? And in the seventies, the sixties, and seventies and eighties, we did reject that stuff like pretty. Uh, convincingly. And right now we're dealing with the aftermath of that rejection. And what I'm seeing now is almost a rediscovery of this. And we're seeing like a, a renaissance of sorts of these ideas, but in a way that we can understand. So before, like the rejection of Catholic Christianity was probably actually a good thing for society because it was, it, it was bloated. It was not fulfilling the purpose that it would, uh, that it was supposed to be. Um, and, uh, you can see it's some, you can even claim it was an evil thing, evil being that which is, you know, bastardized good. And, um, in that sense, but now we're rediscovering these things in a more nuanced way. We have people who are putting these old ideas out and saying, okay, here's why we would do this. And the rejection was almost like as much as we hate it and we, we, we hate what came of it and we hate what some things are doing to society it served a purpose and it's forcing us to reevaluate these old ideas in a more nuanced way so we can better understand them now it's kind of like you give a kid a drug and he's like you know like ritalin or something and they're like why am i taking this i don't understand it but if you say okay you're taking this you need to do this you need to you understand why you're taking you understand what the effect's going to be so they know how to use it and we're rediscovering the meaning behind all of these so that we can fit them into a modern context because 
we're not living in ancient Judea anymore. We're living in something that we've never really seen before, but we're still humans. And so we are in even this discussion right here, we are just like the Western world discovered ancient Greece, Greek thought again, we're rediscovering ancient Western thought again and bringing it back and making it more nuanced and building upon it in a way that's more constructive than it was when we rejected it. So that's kind of something I've been seeing um, lately and I haven't really elaborated it very well very often lately. I think what you're getting at too is partly like the way we're going about and this is sort of what you're saying but what I think is wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, not with what you're saying but how we're going about it. Like if you just look at the books that we're publishing, almost all of our books look like Cosmo mags now. 12 rules to get your man in bed, 13 ways to have better sex, 9 ways to lose light, uh, weight, 14 ways, you know, 10 ways to do this. It, 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 like our intellectual books and resources and libraries look like Cosmo magazines. And I think the, that's our I, modern approach. I have the perfect example of this. Mm. So I found this in the free textbook bin at the U of A. This is a sociology textbook. Wow. <laughs> I'm not fucking kidding. So it's got what makes you an individual in society. Master of perspective. Look at that. They're telling you exactly how to be a perspective thinker. <laughs> Genderless children. And like the only thing not having on this is like, this is sociology. Sociology is supposed to be a like it's it's humanities but it's supposed to be somewhat scientific and it's, it's approach. a group psychology basically right so and if you get into it random page it's got it's it's a magazine this is a and this is what that to me studying. is the problem because we're not actually dealing with the issues the way we used to the enlightenment period came out with better ways of fulfilling these desires so yeah and that's, they had they had sculptures that were unique, architecture that was unique. They had new number theory that was unique, new math, new dress codes, new sports. Like everything about the Renaissance was new, novel, enlightened, but, um, progressive, and upgrade of the status quo. Right, but right it was now, an elaboration of like they they relearned all this new knowledge, and they're like, oh wow, look at this trigonometry that we completely forgot about for a thousand years. Yeah. Well, how would if how do and then they elaborated on just like you said. So they're they're taking these old ideas like Socrates and Plato and all these philosophers like Lucretius of all people who they had never read in a thousand years and they're like, what does this mean? How can we apply this? And it was like it sparked the Enlightenment. But this avatar self is the opposite. What mm -hmm. it's doing is it's doing the TLDR version of everything that we should have been doing long form. Yes. And you can't progress off like you can you. I'm not going to say you can't. What I'm saying is like um, if if you were to study 15 different philosophers and write one paper on 15 philosophers, TLDR would be super useful. Absolutely do that. <clears throat> Cliff notes, whole nine yards. But to say that your study is more in depth than the ones that you're just briefing over is an absolute fallacy, but we choose to believe it because it's easier than actually putting the work in. No person can read everything that's ever been written. But the issue is to assume that you know everything without having read it is blatantly false. It's patently ignorant. And I well, think our, our approach with this avatarism, as I, I'll, I'll coin the phrase now, <laughs> <laughs> our yeah. approach with avatarism with social media and those quick clickbaits and the feedback responses and the views and like everything that we're shooting for, our reward centers, aren't the same rewards that we, we used to have global rewards. Well, and now we have these selfish, internal, personal, junky type of rewards. They're just Mc for like uh, a drug hit. Well, it's McLuhan would say that expansion of thought. McLuhan would posit that the like Marshall McLuhan from the U of M actually uh, would um, posit that the medium is the message. And if if you're putting your if you're interacting and using that medium to communicate. The medium is controlling how you communicate, not like there's some conspiracy. No, the physical like reality of how that medium works is dictating the how you're going to be communicating with everyone else. So it's like telephone, a physical bias. Right. So you get a telephone and it allows people to talk to each other, but they have to talk to each other verbally. So there's only the verbal. 
Now we have this, so now we can have more nuance. You can see me gesturing, so the medium's more efficient and nuanced. If we were in person and on film, we could probably even get more information across to each other. Um, but then YouTube allows you know people to interact with our video in that medium, so it allows us to have people you know give us bite-sized questions and facts and troll us and stuff like that. And that allows for more nuance. But when you're just interacting just like that. You, you lose a lot and you're, and you're siloing yourself into that medium when you have the medium of interpersonal contact in order to communicate. The medium is the message, people. <laughs> so, See, um, I, get, I get really conflicted when I watch a YouTube video, and especially a well-established YouTuber. Um, and I'm, I'm saying well-established, like 20,000 uh, subs, like something... Smaller even, but Not still has, has, yeah, that, that's been out uh, for, let's say, a year plus, whatever it is. I always ask myself, why do I weigh their opinion, whoever it is, so heavily versus this person with this many views versus this person with, like, a million trillion subs? Like, what what makes this person more than this person? At the end of the day, it's the only question that I have left is, like, how popular are they? How many other people are watching this? Some people just go you know? by how it makes them feel like, oh, that sounds right. Like I, I have people in my family who are, will just make shit up off the top of their head and be like, this is how the body works. And I'll be like, why? Where'd you get that? Oh, I watched a video on YouTube. And so like, no, you need to be critical. Like it's, that's part of reading is being like, mm, I disagree, but it's a good book. And then like, that's what you're supposed to be able to do. And you're supposed to be able to use your judgment and be reasonable. And that's how you tell because you can't just use popularity as an authority. And the other, like, you can't just say, oh, that seems right. Why does it seem right? <laughs> the, the, the problem that I have, though, deep down is like the reason why that I'm really gravitating towards certain channels is the fact that they're using their soapbox uh, if more efficiently than another one, I think is my problem. And you just get sucked into these. And it, it doesn't matter what their opinion is at the end of the day. They're just another person. They just happen to be online. Mm -hmm. And that's what I can't wrap my head around is like why you get... And because there's that emotional attachment you're just saying, we have a more uh, refined media now. We can do talk and video i can comment directly towards the person that said these things in this video and and those kind of uh aspects of like how we communicate now but it's just like it it's a mind fuck to think like this person's more important than this person because of how many views they have or how many uh comments uh they or whatever subs and whatever else it's just it gets in your head to a point where you can't even differentiate and this is where other people are, are coming from is like the information you're getting, you start to trust the person. You develop a relationship with them almost in a weird fucked up kind of way. Oh, you do. Definitely. But Just based on the numbers you're saying, right? Well, you know, based on the numbers and, and of course, based on what they're saying, how they act, what kind of accent they have, what kind of background they have, ethnicity, whatever else. Um, but it's just it's like a mind fuck where like these complete strangers are in your living room with you 24 seven. You kind of get like attached to them. And you just kind of start taking what they're saying as as gospel. Uh, pardon the what? pun, because we're talking about well, religion. Like, no, it's perfectly apropos. Well, yeah. what you got to do is you got to have a like as many voices. Like if you have only like two voices, and or like mm -hmm. you watch like Alex Jones way too much. Oh God! Like, <laughs> yeah, guy's... but if you watch Alex yeah. Jones and sixty other people, right, you're gonna have a bit more. But like, who has time to watch more? So like, some of it. Like I've got a few channels that I'm subscribed to that are literally just entertainment channels. I've got yeah. how-to channels and the ones that explain it better. Like I've got like one network direction and they explain networking really well, which is why I'm subscribed to them because they are better presentation for the information I want. Just network tech. Um, and But like some of them are just entertainment. The people who provide better entertainment are the ones that are going to get more views. Now with stuff like this that we're doing right now, a lot of it is luck <laughs> and algorithms and most whatever. of it i think yeah. is a time thing because once you have enough content out people will stumble off one video one at a time like over time you know what i mean like i find channels with a thousand two thousand subs and they've been around like a year before youtube ever recommends it to me well, one yeah, thing i'm on youtube for eight hours a day like statistically that's what my youtube stats say like i'm on it one thing i'll do is and for yeah. radio i'm on it for news i'm on it for entertainment too at the end of the day i, I watch like the comedy mo monologues or whatever 
But to me, the um, it's different for us as like 30 somethings because people growing yeah, up with point. this don't think of the connection of that you're talking about, that emotional connection to the YouTubers they watch or the influence that the number of subscribers and likes and comments has on their impression of the video. Something with no views and no comments, people are easy to dismiss. It's just, oh, they're talking out of their ass. But people with like a million views can absolutely completely shit all over the, all over the, the camera and nobody bats an eye. Like mm. it just doesn't even phase them that Alex Jones is speaking. <laughs> like everything he says is asinine and so many people don't even realize it because they're like well look how popular he can't be that crazy well he's not completely wrong on everything it's like yeah even a stop clock is wrong twice right twice a day yeah I love <laughs> like, like for me what i do is I'll, and i'll like i'll find a channel that i like that is saying something that i haven't heard before or saying in a different way and i'll be like whoa this guy's great and then i'll watch like a whole bunch of videos on it and then eventually i'll just get the gist of like after a while and i'll be like i don't i get it i know what he was gonna say already and then i'll try and move on and i'll and i'll find some different perspective or view or something and maybe i'll come back to it if you know in a while to see oh do they have anything new to say on this no okay and oh they do and then i'll watch that but like that's me i will generally try i will have an inclination to move on and look for something new because even though like i don't just want to hear what i want to hear but i want to hear different voices and i will get i will get bored if i don't have a new voice that's you know in my head i don't want to hear the same song over and over again and to me like this type of discussion is just it's it's like a song like a, like i don't want to hear the same beat over and over and over and over again and to me the intellectual beats that we're hitting you know you can you can get too used to it and not want to move on but when you put presentation on there with it, when you stick, you know, you make it clickbaity, you make it, you know, entice those, you know, lizard brain aspects of it. And people get tricked into thinking that they're constantly getting that, the, 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 the novelty. Uh, when in reality, like I seek novelty to enhance the variety of what I'm in, in, imbibing in my brain. But, a lot of people just are there for the novelty itself and that so like i want the novelty because switching to something new means i'm going to get something good because i'm looking for the result of my use of my novelty people just it's like the it's like eating candy and you want the initial taste and not the stomach feel um just kind of how i'm trying to get it across so i think we are kind of addicted to that 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 instant novelty that youtube does allow although it is a great tool for stuff like we're doing here i think there's an awesome use for for youtube if people just sort of get used to it like right now everything in technology and communication is so new that we haven't figured out a way to like balance it with normal real life and i think that's an evolution thing so i don't think it's we're screwed forever no like getting back to like the subject topic of uh, like Concepts oh, yeah. of self as well as um, faith in like religious spirituality or whatever. Basically, what we're referring to is that long term gain. And we're talking about social gains, like groups of people as individuals working together for the enhancement of everyone in the group. And the group is the species. It's not these black people, these white people, and these yellow people, and these trans people. None of that matters. Really fundamentally, borders don't matter. They're just there to help us organize and structure ourselves. Borders Small are there to help us easier. manage our, our natural resources across our land so we don't piss them all away just because somebody wants to make a billion dollars in a lifetime. You, you can spread out justice systems and rules and rights so people can move to places where the law more suits their personal core values and moralities. Like There are uses to borders. But to say it doesn't matter what happens in the States because I'm Canadian is completely ignorant. That like The point of global communications and globalized trade and the thing that makes us so efficient as species, as creatures, is that we don't do that. <laughs> it's by stopping tribalism that we opened trade and became like, now I can buy shoes instead of making them by hand. And like I can work two hours at a job that's easy where I sit at a, at a desk and look at a monitor and I buy a pair of shoes with that two hours. Whereas it would have taken me weeks to learn how to make shoes and they would have turned out shitty and I would have had to keep doing it every three months. So like 
the benefits we get from the synergies of society is sort of what I'm getting to is the long-term fulfillment benefits we get from things from like faith and spirituality as an aftershock of having thought of our own individual concepts of self as being emergent properties from the world and universe at large and not just our world and our universe. Mm -hmm. that, that really, to me, puts a pinpoint to all of what we're talking about today. I think uh, you brought up a really interesting point um, there. Uh, I'm just going to elaborate a little bit. Uh, but uh, um, when I was listening to both of you, there is another uh, key element that, that we haven't discussed yet uh, with this uh, inclusivity and the way that we're treating all of these groups is it's actually creating more prejudice more racism more segregation um the more that the left seems to be pushing for this agenda we're we're losing that ability to say okay you're not a black person you're john smith <laughs> you're not a uh, hindu you're you know it's whatever it's easier to persecute an avatar than a person no a person has a nuanced view well why did you do that well, there was a child drowning, and I had to decide between uh, between wrecking this guy's Chevy to get to the child, and you know that child dying. So that's why I drove that guy's Chevy into the river. It's like, damn, <laughs> it's a lot but more I, complicated. I, I, and so, but like that's a thing. So like it's easy to say, well, you know, and then you know, I was on my way home from church. Church? Oh my! Oh, we gotta get rid of this guy. It's like it's easy because we we make him an avatar. You slot him into a place, and then you right. get an, a nice little neat algorithm uh, from this. And I think that's the irony, though, is as we're trying to develop this perfect image of self that we project to everyone else, what we're actually doing is dissolving our sense of our actual selves. We're like dissolving our individualism in within a group. <laughs> Was that? Like the goth kids in high school, they tried so hard to not conform, and they all show they up to conform. To and then they all look the same when they show up to school in all the new clothes. Yeah. Uh. So, but you know, it, it's a funny because it's a microcosm of so, uh, sociology. So I, I don't want to make fun of the goth kids because I think that's vitally important to us understanding ourselves. No, as they're adults. experimenting with their lives. That's, exactly. that's important. <laughs> that that that's the evidence and proof that we shouldn't be doing it because it's infantile. We shouldn't be infantilizing adults. To be more like that, we should be growing out of that and mm -hmm. becoming more acceptant and tolerant of the fact that the specialty of our species is our individuality and our our diversity. It's yeah, but that's need that's to form a quota for. You don't need to build diversity by counting it. You just have it. You're born different. Like you just need. But that's like the issue that I was saying is is like the the more that we reach out and branch for this this uh, idealized world where everyone is included in all this it seems like the more groups we're creating and, and and separating people like you know the goth kids the raver kids the sonar kids the you know what i mean yeah it's counterproductive it, it's not it, it doesn't helping fix anything. the problem and i i think uh this is another uh sh offshoot of the fact that we don't have one central place to go or belief system anymore and it's 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 becoming almost like a, a high school mentality you're right in, in, uh, sort of like something to aim for it some transcendental good yes. that we can uh they're, we can they're... shoot towards but like and without it we remain infantilized so you know what yeah. is an adult well an adult doesn't matter because you know i want to play with board games all my life it's just like cool uh, I'm going to go get married and have kids. <laughs> I want there to be people who spend their lives playing board games. I want those yeah, people to I, exist. I, I <laughs> never wanted kids or to get married. I mean, maybe one day marriage, but I've never wanted kids. I mean, that's just a structure. I don't. That's that's like, I can't force that. Anybody, but like, I'm just, that's one example of growing up. But like growing yeah. up to me is taking responsibility and being able to make decisions for yourself. Like, um, do, do you and, think, do you think and, that like, part of growing up then is to have kids is to get married like is it hand in hand you have to do these things to feel like uh, a girl i think having kids definitely helps because it shows you what a child is but at the same time like i grew up because i didn't like the way i was when i was like in my early 20s i thought i was an idiot and like mm -hmm. just like i'm a i'm a fool i have to like i'm an adult now i have to grow up i don't feel like i'm grown up and then i started just making decisions and dealing with stuff and it's like oh 
I'm at the reins of my life and I'm going to deal with whatever life throws at me. That's when you become an adult. And I think a lot of people aren't taking, like, you don't have to get married and have kids. If you, if you find the woman of your dreams, get married, do it. Um, that's, I'm going to, I'm going to put that as a thing, but like, if you don't, you can still become responsible human, but like, I am seeing that a lot of people aren't they're like, I, don't know, I saw this in, in university where a lot of people are referring like, oh, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to attack this myself. I'm going to say, I'm going to look to the teacher to help me with this. Or I'm going to look to the professor. I'm going to look to my boss or I'm going to pass the buck onto the government. It's like, no, 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 do it yourself. Like, and it's it's like, yeah, you can do it by having kids, by getting married. But like, one of the things you can do is change the oil in your own car, like fix your own drywall. And this is, this are like little things that you can do to become an adult. Cause then you're having faith in yourself. It's like, Oh, I gotta, I, I don't do, I don't know anything about cars or computers. Oh, but then you can like changing your oil in your car really actually isn't that hard. It's actually absurdly easy. And we pay $60 at like Mr. Lube or something. And all you need is a funnel and a pan. Uh, <laughs> the car comes with the jack. Jordan, that's where you're totally wrong. Cause my avatar online has plenty of faith in me. <laughs> I don't mean in real life. <laughs> so, but like, but, yeah, you're, <laughs> and I, just to what you were me saying, off there, though, but I, yeah, I, go on. <laughs> <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but sort, sort of what you're saying too is um, people's lives can be whatever they want it to be as long as they're honestly wanting them. Yes. As long as they're not doing something because they think they should be doing it, like I should like this movie because everyone likes it, I should like this channel because everybody Shit. likes it. Um, <laughs> It, it's better that somebody who doesn't want to get married doesn't get married because you can live a fulfilling life by meditating in Tibet in a monastery for 20 years and you'll learn things and experience just ideas that you could never fathom if you grew up and yeah. had a wife and kids. But it's not to say one's better than the other. It's just different. And we want diversity. So instead of saying like you be different in this way, just let people be different. If somebody wants to join a monastery and come back to the world and just be like completely head in the clouds or if they want to play board games as like a, an obsessive like fanaticism like i don't want to say like clinically obsessive but just like their fun that they go home to every day is board games or sports or exercising so they're super buff or just having sex all the time at rave parties whatever they want to do as long as they're doing it safely they're not hurting other people that is diversity as long as they're honestly doing it because they want to do it there's no like one way to have a fulfilling life there's only one way to have your fulfilling life, and that's by trying I think, everything, by learning I think, whatever you can learn, and by experiencing. I think you're right, itself. but I think it needs to be uh, amended by saying that there are ways to have a uh, unfulfilling life, and um, True. hurting other people, <laughs> hurting other people, not like not being not, productive. Not well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like you, you, you're gonna play board games all day. That's great. What are you doing with that? Well, it's like, you know, when you're, you're a kid and your parents tell you like, oh, stop playing video games. I'm like, I'm 14. Like, what are you doing with your life? It's just like, and then you're sitting there like, shut up. But then you're in your head, you're like, that's a good point. <laughs> exactly. Like, I can't do anything with this at all. So um, maybe. But does that mean you should walk into a, a Kohl's bookstore and just pretend you're interested in books just because you're supposed to so that you don't feel guilty about walking into GameStop? Well, that'll like, work short that. term because you walk in and be like, I'm an intellectual book. And then you know, eventually, like someone's going to challenge you. There's an exposure. Like essentially someone's going to be like, oh, what are you reading? You're like, oh, books. And it's just like and the guy that's <laughs> going to hire you and give you that job at Kohl's or something is going to be like, yeah, I think I'm going to go with someone else. And because you have to cultivate yourself in some direction. And that can be any direction. You can be someone who designed board games, but you can't just be someone who plays board games. I think that's the distinction. Um, and I think when you use the word productive, I think that was important because productivity isn't just like, how many things have you made today? It's like, what? how have you used your skills to affect change in your own life or in other lives? Contributed to everyone else's lives yeah and what you're exposed to like your experience did you feel sensory perceptions was it hot out was it sticky out was it dry was it like those types of things are all parts of living mm -hmm. 
and that's the Buddhist in me speaking, but I'm just saying like, there is value to find in that if you're looking for it, but it's a slow, long-term type of progression towards mm-hmm. fulfillment. It's not about instant gratification. And I think that's sort of the point I'm trying to drill home is that um, hey. diversity is great because it's different and you can't dictate how people should mm-hmm. be different. They have to just be oh, different. Yeah. And you have to just disagree with their lifestyles and not want it for yourself. You need weird but people. You have to we allow really it. do need weird people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need weird people. They're they're the Einsteins and the Oilers and the you know well, not Erler. not not, not the last name. game. <laughs> no, <laughs> I meant earlier. E U L E R. That guy published like 180 papers like per year for Jesus. years. Like he was just genius. A viper. Anyway, <laughs> uh, are you guys good to wrap up? I'm about uh, yeah. Like, I'm, uh, I'm th- final comments. I. Think, find out what you can have faith in and and just follow it down because you do need faith in your life and don't disregard things, but um, explore what faith means to you. That's Word that's up. My... You all stand? Yeah, I'll leave it to Justin to give us our final thoughts. <laughs> I had a really... Jerry Springer moment. I, I was going to actually ask you guys uh, if you think there's a solution to this problem, but I feel like the, the answer to that is uh, too convoluted to to include at this point, um, given our uh, energy levels. But I think it's really, really important to just unplug just just a few hours a week. I, I think that would, would change a lot of people's impression of what online culture and what their their technology that they use is should be for more than what they're using it for just get back to reality for a bit you know i remember on my honeymoon on, it was during the 2016 know. election on my honeymoon and we were hearing mm-hmm. nothing but you know trump and hillary trump and hillary trump and hillary yeah, and we yeah. left we unplugged for two three weeks and we got yeah. back and we did not give one care as to what was <laughs> yeah. going on because it's just we, we we realized how not like it wasn't important what was important like we're watching we're we literally went to the mountains for two weeks and we're like mm-hmm. oh, here's something that's showing yeah, us and it's still there when you come back right like you didn't miss it <laughs> and like if we're actually at war then okay yeah if people are actually going around killing you know canadians and stuff then we need to and like someone's actually attacking then that's important but like otherwise it's all good, man. Like, find your zen. To me, my solution to it is be diverse by not counting the diversity. Stop saying, like, oh, we need more ethnic people in this commercial. Like, that shit doesn't help. If there's an issue... No. Said, be no. said by a panel of three white men. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if there's an I'm issue of people right being there. hired, they should come to us three white men and say, why haven't you hired more black people? Find out why we're not hiring them and then help fix that. Like, see the, Edmonton, the root of the like problem. 3% black people here. <laughs> That's the problem in Winnipeg. <laughs> there are a, a lot of native people, like aboriginal people from across Canada, and there's a lot of um, racial sort of uh, programs Tension. to help. Oh, sorry. <laughs> to help with <laughs> inclusions and stuff like that. But I think the issue with those programs is they're, they're, they're breeding resentment in the process. They're making other people not want to hire them, but do it because they're forced. And you don't stop racism or prejudice by forcing people out of it. What you need to do is find out why there's a prejudice and prove it wrong. We Mm. have empiricism. If we want to have faith in something, we should have faith in, hey, I'm not sure about that, but it's verifiable. I can check it. And And that's what we should be using the internet for. There's always going to be some flat earther. There's always going to be some idiot. There's always going to be some unhinged asshole. There's always going to be some guy who's just flat out going nuts and or a troll or something yeah. Yeah. but like the rest of us can get on with our lives and be like you know some guy's gonna come up and your 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 friends be like you guys know you're sitting with the black guy it's like dude are you okay <laughs> <laughs> you but need some help stop amplifying the small groups that's the problem you can't put them on the same weight as some as another group like i i was using the uh the climate change example you can't pretend like there are equal oppositions to both sides of the argument when they're all right um, we need to focus on empiricism, and with technology, we have the the resources to cross reference everything. That's what we need to do. Absolutely, mm-hmm. everything we should be cross referencing, including the stuff we say on this channel. Do not yes. believe what we say. 
just use it as some some type of incitement of thought, an idea pro prov provocation. Well, that's why thought the comment section is so great because you guys, our viewers, can uh, comment down there and ask us questions and criticize us and send us sources that tell us we're wrong. And then if you subscribe, you can keep doing that and uh, <laughs> you can maintain a criticism on us that we vitally need. <laughs> yeah, we welcome it. So I th I think that's the that's the way to move forward through all this. Is yeah, to start, honest. Yeah, yeah, just to be honest and and empirical. Start counting yeah. the things that are yeah. countable, but not forcing numbers to change because that doesn't fix problems. It just makes you look different. But that's mm -hmm. that whole and avatar per problem. But the government's doing the avatar problem too. They want to look more inclusive and yeah. Like just to add to that, Chris, I feel like that is one uh, major failing point uh that we're missing just as a very last thought that uh we're not being held to the fire of accountability at all and that, i think that is what needs to happen first exactly what you're saying to weigh in on facts first before you even talk about it <laughs> you need to have this. truth <laughs> yeah cool well thank you so much for uh being our special guest once again yostein yeah this is fun <laughs> but, yeah We'll have to ask you back, but thanks for the time and energy. Yeah, thank you. And nice to see you again, jo uh, Jordan. I was even Jordan. Jordan, sorry. sorry. You know what? <laughs> That's my word. Sorry. You sorry. <laughs> Jordan's my slave sorry. name. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're slave name. <laughs> ironic because you're the black guy. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks again. Cool. Properly offended. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Bye.